started wrestling and so she said when she came home from the hospital she put me in the crib and she heard me kind of making noises and I went in there and, and I was bridging off my back right away so <laughs> did a hip ice and turned over right away on the first day so I've been wrestling my whole life I didn't like being on my back then I don't like being on my back now and so the bottom line is I get off I stay off my back in this sport and back in life except for a few MMA people that know how to throw holes and can end a match. Uh, you know, you don't want to go to your back uh, in, in wrestling and, and you want to stay off it. You want to put your opponent on your back. But anyway, I just walk around the room looking at the walls, you know, and I, you know, I'm pretty impressed you got a lot of names up there. You got a lot of names. Uh, you know, it's, they might not all be state champions, but, you know, they're, but I'm familiar with some of them, you know, and, and I learned something today, actually, just walking around. You know, I, a guy named Ted Parker who was a state champion. And he was a few years older than me, but I wrestled him in an event uh, back, in, back in the day. Uh, there's another guy named Dan Sherman that actually wrestled here. And he, I, I think he was, he was second in the state. I never knew that. I was his coach. But actually, he was already at the University of Iowa for four years when I came in. So he was only under me for one year. And but I didn't even know he was only second in the state. And all of a sudden, he wins a national title that year. But I remember what I had to do all year long with him. He had to work something special with him. 
Uh, he just, at the end of practice, it was like, it was like tough to get him to condition hard. I, I, maybe he was conditioning hard, but it didn't look like it to me. So I, I was in his ear a lot, and he can remember that. And he might not even have liked it, or until he won the Nationals here at the end of the year. But, you know, I don't, I don't know. So it was almost uncomfortable with me and him. But I'll tell you, second in the state to a national wrestling champion. And, you know, and if I would have known that he'd only been second, I figured he's probably two or three-time Illinois state champion, just based on how good I felt the guys were in the room. So, it, you know, it's pretty, pretty interesting. So, and that's coaching. And there's another guy named Combs, Steve Combs, who used to coach here. Uh, actually, when, when I was actually becoming a good wrestler, or I should say a really good wrestler, I spent my whole 68 summer at, at a training camp. It was the Olympic training camp. And uh, he was one of the guys, he was on the Greco-Roman team. He was one of the guys that I actually worked out with quite a bit, even though he was a lot bigger than me at the time. But it, but it was, he was able to, uh, I was able to go and spend time and I think it made a difference that summer. In fact, I felt like that summer of training in the, in, for the Olympic, in the Olympic training camp with a guy named Combs and a guy named Holzer, uh, you know, and, and Bobby Douglas, these names, uh, Wayne Wells, uh, they all made a huge difference. But again, I was at that summer training camp every day for six, seven, eight weeks and doing all the things that the, uh, the Olympic team was doing. And so it was, it was paying off. And they, they probably didn't know where I was going to go exactly, but they know when they worked out with me that it was not an easy workout, just from the fact that they may have been able to beat me a little bit, but not after the first minute. So uh, the bottom line is I made up for you know, the size difference or, or maybe how they were better. I just made up for it in, in, in one way. So just in this room alone here, just walking in here today and being with people that help run this sport, Rich Bender, you know, we, and, and Jeff was actually putting this together, you know, it's pretty amazing, because I, I imagine I could walk into a lot of rooms in wrestling in the United States, and actually, if they have boards like this, I can probably go up and, and have connections, and that, that to me is, is, is pretty impressive, but I've been doing it my whole life, I've been doing it my whole life, so anyway, I, uh, I got another, uh, uh, my wife's over here, Kathy, she put up with me for 43 years, but right beside her is uh, Dan Levy, Dan, Dan, I think he's a coach, where are you a coach at, Dan? Wilmette Junior High. Wilmette Junior High? Yeah, I used to coach here for two years, a long time ago. Well, that's so, good. So I have to well, he's an amazing story, he's an amazing story for me. Uh, he had an older brother, he still does, uh, Bill, yep. and Bill actually, would you tell the story of Bill, how he ended up on the Iowa wrestling team? Yeah, um, Can you talk to me? Yeah, my, all, my, all my brothers and I were football and, and hockey players, and uh, my brother went to the University of Iowa, uh, he was in a fraternity there, I think his sophomore year, he met up with Lindley Kistler. Uh, the Kistler brothers were the strong wrestlers from California. All of them all Americans, I think, coach, am I correct? And Marty was a two-time national champion. He met up with Lindley Kistler in a class. Lindley wasn't doing very well. He needed a tutor. And uh, my brother, we were all athletic, and started tutoring. And uh, next thing you know, hey, why don't you come over to the wrestling room? My brother was living at a place he didn't like to want to live at anymore, so he started to live with the Kistler, bro Kistler boys, and they started beating on him. And they got him over the room. What? They started beating on him. Okay. He, my brother, would, you talk about lying on your back. My brother would be at the apartment lying on his back. The next thing you know, somebody would jump on him and pin him. Okay, but was, was he a wrestler? No. Never wrestled. Never. No wrestling background at all. And they took him over to the room, they started teaching him, and uh, I may be incorrect, but did he qualify for the 88 trials? Who? 
Bill. I'm not sure on that one. It, I, I know he was wrestling with those guys. I know Rico Ciparelli, who's a national champion, used to wrestle my brother all the time, and my brother had great hands and hip defense. But what, you're, what, what he's saying is that he never wrestled before. He was a sophomore in college, and he stepped on the campus of the University of Iowa, who was now going for their eighth or seventh seven in a row. Seven national titles in a row. And he came to me, and he wanted to go out for wrestling. And what did he do? He came out, never missed the practice. He used to tell me about the, the mornings he would run to your house, five miles out of town, get breakfast, go back, and he just worked hard. It was something he found, he loved it, and he, the sport of wrestling taught him things that he still uses today. Uh, so he never wrestled. Never wrestled. He on the toughest college He's on playing the with United my States shoes. America, and did he get to compete? He competed, he won matches, he didn't, he, he, <laughs> he, he, he competed and he, I know he wrestled in the U.S. Open, out in Vegas when it was in Vegas. Uh, through him, I started to wrestle. Uh, he was, I never got the best of him until, well after college when we were wrestling, I gave him a black eye. Uh, Sophomore year, high school, nope. Sophomore freshman year, he came to Iowa, came out to the, 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 the sport at Iowa, and did pretty well. And so now he's a wrestling guy. That's his life. And here's guys that waited that long. And so you got a lot of years on these guys. And I'll tell you, I still, and I'm not so sure I remember this on you, but your brother, and you, you might get mad at me, your brother, I think, had a tremendous sprawl. Yes. Right. And he scored on goal behinds all the time. Yeah, he, uh, from playing goaltender, he had great hips and great movement and uh, his footwork. And he learned that, and that's why Rico liked wrestling, because he was tough to score on. Because Rico didn't like to shoot that much, right? No, and when he did, he wanted to be successful. And so he could be successful against my brother, who could only get a sprawl and a goal behind. He knew he was doing something right. All right, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. For me, it's just, uh, you look back and it's kind of like, how did somebody win college wrestling matches at that level? And they had never wrestled until maybe a sophomore or junior year. I'm not sure how many years he spent with it. Three maybe or something. But, but anyway, so, uh, so let me look at my bag here. Well, this thing here is just a book. Well, it's not put together too good anymore. Book, pretty much uh, just pages, just pages in a book called The Heart of a Champion by a guy named Bob Richards. He basically was the first person, well he was, the first person ever on the Wheaties box. He was Olympic ball ball champion, 1952, 1956. And he wrote a book called The Heart of a Champion. And the book actually talks about great sports feats of all time and how they kind of, he went in and he interviewed and he got, he had these great sports feats. And he also is a minister. And he also actually, you know, the Bible, it's a great book, but he condensed it into an easier version for me. When I was a kid, he came and spoke just like I did. I am doing right now, but he spoke to the whole high school and then he had these books and I bought one. And little did I know that this book was going to come at, at such a huge time in my life. Just won a high school state championship as a sophomore, first year in high school. And, and I went and listened to him. And it was one of these things that I bought this book. And I really hadn't opened it yet. And within a matter of 
maybe a month after I bought this book from him. I'd already started reading it, but hadn't really got through it yet. I had a sister that was uh, 15 years, or I was 15, she was 19, and we were out of town and she was still home because she was, you know, of age. She was going to meet us as a family and about 100 miles away and she didn't show up. And the bottom line, a, a neighbor had broken into our house the night before and murdered her. And so, you know, all of a sudden in my life, I needed some help. But I, I could see my parents could, had needed more help than I did. And so I went back to this book and this book actually really gave me a lot of answers to questions that you have and actually gave me the, the inspiration to help my mom and dad a lot during that particular time because it wasn't just about the murder, it was about they were kind of beating up each other themselves at night and through a lot of drinking and staying up late and arguing. And so it, just, it took somebody with uh, good mentoring because I had good mentoring, actually, from my parents, which is very important. I had good mentoring from the YMCA as a kid. I had really good teachers and coaches, better than most people will ever get, just because they actually proved it on what, how, what they did for excellence, whether it was state championship teams or whether it was the, the teacher that won the, the best teacher award or whatever. I just, I had those, and I feel very lucky to have those. So I had a lot of uh, so much, so on stability, and so I went back to this book actually for some information, and it helped me through that period, and it helped me with my parents, and obviously my parents actually uh, lived for another many, many years, and uh, you know, I, it's just no way you, you, you thought that was gonna happen. So there's things in your life through mentoring that can make a big difference. You gotta remember how lucky you are, and I don't believe in luck, believe you make your own luck, and most people do, but the reason why I believe that I'm lucky is just because of what I just said. The mentoring that I have had with people, because not everybody gets that. Not everybody gets that. Depends on your environment. Depends on who's around you. You can do some of that stuff yourself by making sure you hang around the people that are positive and the people that are doing good things. But you got to remember, you're at this camp. You got parents sitting out here. You got coaches over here. You got a guy named Jeff, Jeff Levititz. He's helping this school with this program, with this wrestling. Not because he was the Olympic champion, because of what it did for him, whether he was the Olympic champion or second or state qualified. State qualified. It's not about your names on the wall, but you know what, guys? When you work hard, you may not be, it may be not surprising, and all of a sudden you might end up on the wall. And that's okay, that's good. You may not, and, you get, and you're gonna be also strong if, if, you know, because you've had this opportunity to be in a good situation. And what I mean by lucky is only that you might not have been born here. You might not have had the parents that took care of you. You might not have had the teachers. You might have been, instead of being here at wrestling camp, you might have been born into a place that sent you to terrorist camp. That's, what, that, that's in the world right now. That's going on. And so that's a product of the environment. And so you got to remember that's, that's how you're lucky, that you have more opportunity than people that are born some places and have that unluckiness of where they happen to, uh, to be born about. So anyway, the guy was a track and field guy. One of the things that really uh, meant a lot to me was there's, there's, a, there's a chapter in here or a couple pages on the first four minute mile. And you might, anybody in track? You, you know, you probably have to learn to run a little bit too, guys. Everybody's got to be in track when you're wrestling. So after practice, you do some sprints and things like that. But 
It <laughs> describes the person that broke the first four first minute miles. So let me tell you about that. Because that was one of the most intriguing stories for me. At that time, when he, when he was writing this book, back in the, you know, whenever he wrote the book, because he was 52 and 56 uh, Olympics, he was writing the book from the point of view that science, doctors, people of authority, said no human being can ever run a four minute mile. They would die first. They would die first. I don't know if you know what the, and so quite a while ago, somebody broke the four minute mile and they didn't die, but I'll tell you how he had to do it. After it was four laps in a, in a mile, and he was down two and he had two to go and he had to talk himself into the last two laps by saying one more step, one more step, one more step. He had to do that every step for two laps or a half a mile. And as he passed over the finish line, he passed out. He ran, he ran himself to exhaustion, and he, his time was 3.59 point you know, something. But you know what's amazing? The four minute mile now is pretty common. It's pretty common. And you know what the four minute mile, um, you know what the mile record is now instead of four minutes? That record instead of 359.6 or whatever it was, it's like, I'm not sure, it's probably three, and again, I'm wrong, could be, but I'm not gonna give you the exact, but I think it's somewhere around 20 seconds less. It's like 341. So they were gonna die at four minutes, and nobody's died yet at 341. So it's unrealistic put any barriers on your life. It's unrealistic. Now you gotta be somewhat realistic and you do it properly. For me, you know, once, I was already a state champion and I'll tell you, when, I, when it wasn't that easy, but my coach recognized that there was just something special about this kid. And so he, even though he was a first year high schooler and they had good teams, and you can't do this now anymore, so the coach here can't give you this, but, well, maybe he can, be, but I don't know. I'm not going to follow up on it. He can't give you a key to the school to open the school up at 6.30 every morning, the gymnasium. I had a key to the school because my coach said, wow, you want to come work out early? That'd be a good influence, so here's the key because I'm not going to come because I live five miles away. And I, you know, I got, Anyway, he didn't want to come. He wanted me to open it up because I wanted to be there. He, and so he gave me a key to the school, and so I came. And you know what? I was a sophomore, and there was a good team. I was on a good team. But what happened was I was the only guy coming. I was the only guy going there. And when I was the only guy going there, when I'd go in that door with that key, and I'd go and I'd work out, I'd go into a gym about twice this big. I'd run around the gym probably 14, 15 times. We had chin bars. Uh, chin bars. I was doing chin. We had ropes. We had ropes uh, and so on and so forth. I was the only guy for the first two weeks before the actual competition started. I made the team as a sophomore, and I was all of a sudden one and zero. Oh. Then I was two and zero. Oh. Then I was three and zero. Oh. Then I was four and zero. Oh. Then I was five and zero. Oh. And so I'm still coming in the mornings, and I open that door as I'm six and zero, oh, and I'm going in there, and all of a sudden, as I close the door. Somebody's grabbing the door behind me. I look, and it was one of my teammates. It was one of my teammates. So then all of a sudden, I'm 8 and 0, I'm 9 and 0, there's another teammate. Then I'm 11 and all of a sudden, there's half the team. By the, and then all of a sudden, there's the whole team coming in, in the morning. And the thing about it is they weren't going to let this kid come in. He, maybe he was a leader on, on the mat, but he hadn't proved himself anything. And it takes a little success as well to get a group to follow you because a lot of people don't really think about, well, what it's worth. What it's worth. Not everybody ended up going undefeated that came in and run on the morning, but we won the state champ. We took second in the state that year as a team. The next year we won the state. My senior year we won the state as well. So, you know, it's, it's one of these things that
takes a team to win the total thing. It only takes one guy to get something started. But it takes one guy to also prove himself that that extra work is really worth it. Because otherwise, people are doing all this work for what? To get beat? So on and so forth. Well, you know what? If you're getting beat, there's a chances are you're getting beat because you may need a little more competitive edge. And that little more competitive edge is going to give you a win sooner or later. If you never had your hand raised, you got to wait until you get your hand raised to get the real feeling. And when you get that real feeling, you're going to know what it is. You're going to know what it is. And even if you haven't had a lot of wins, and if you don't get a lot of wins, that doesn't mean you can't learn how to compete. Because competition is something that you want to be able to learn from this sport as well as all these other life skills. Ours is a special sport. It's a tougher sport, probably the toughest, and that's why a lot of times now we have trouble getting kids into it because there's too many easy things out there. And you know what? We can't be about all easy things. When you go to the, when you, when you have to go cut a tree down, chances are you'll use a chainsaw. You know? What if that chainsaw runs out of uh, gas or breaks down? Well, you gotta have an ax with you. You gotta know how to use that ax, too, in life. So it's not just about a convenient chainsaw. If you need that heat, if you need that, that wood, you know, you're gonna have to use your own strength. And you, and you get this stuff from wrestling. All kinds of disciplines in the sport. All kinds of nutritional disciplines, performance disciplines, one-on-one uh, -on -one team, like that, open the door up. Open that door up. But anyway, uh, it's amazing that we have people in the world that give credit to this sport, even though they're the best at what they do and it's not wrestling. There's a writer named John Irving. And you probably don't read his writing, it's pretty crazy. Maybe the moms and dads do. But he is had 16 bestsellers, sold like 17 million books, you know, so far. And, he, and he's had a mo motion pictures have been made out of it. The thing I like about John Irving is he doesn't say he learned his discipline to put out all this work from Writer's Workshop. He learned how to do it from Writer's Workshop, but his late night hours, his extra work, all came from wrestling. He gives wrestling the credit. He gives wrestling and there's several people in the world that do that. And right now, Jeff Levitan, where's Jeff? Right now, he's talking to me in the last day when I'm here about his business, about what has been done in his life. And even though he is not one of the two state champions up there, he was a qualifier. And I think if he even wasn't a qualifier, well, maybe, I don't know, he might have had to have that to get to where exactly where he was. So don't underestimate me. I'm not saying you don't want to be good, because you want to be good. Always want to be good. It's always fun, this, much more than not. But the bottom line is every time it's 50-50. What do I mean by that? Well, one gets this and one don't. And this is what happens. If you get this a lot, you're not going to like this. You're not going to like it. So hopefully you work hard enough get it raised enough so you know that that's where you want. And you know what? When you carry it off the mat into life, you're going to get your hand raised a lot if you take a discipline. It's, it's pretty easy to be good off the mat. It's pretty tough to be good on the mat. It's pretty easy to be good off the mat if you've been on the mat first. I just want you to know that. So anyway, pretty much going to end up and uh, if anybody wants uh, I got way more things I can talk. Right, yeah, I'll just Give me one more example. <laughs> well, I got another one here. Let's see. I'm pretty much done here. Let's see what else I got in here. Oh. Don't start me on this. My uh, coach. I should have brought this out. This is another hour. <laughs> <laughs> It's called the Harvard Business Review. I just got this in the mail. I get these every two or three months, I think they are. So, first of all, I was just out in uh, Harvard 
given a, a speech to a, to a wrestling group, or not to Harvard, out to Boston, and there's eight colleges that were along Harvard. They got Harvard, then you got MIT, and then you got all these other schools. And I was there, and I, I hadn't really been there before to, for what I noticed. I was there back in this 1971, 1972, but all I saw was the inside of a, a wrestling room. In fact, that's, I've traveled the world all over, and that's all I've seen, the inside of a wrestling room. Which, hey, I love it, that's, that's me. So when I was there, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm looking at all these colleges, and I go, well, how many of these colleges have wrestling? And the guys go, whoa, Harvard. MIT has a club. And I just, I couldn't believe it, you know. And so it really bothered me. And then I said, well, how's the high school wrestling in the city of Boston? Uh, I don't know if we have any. <laughs> well, we got some on the outside. And so, you know what? The level of improvement, the level of expansion, even though we're every, we're 180 countries in the world, and we're in all, most of all the states, I think the only state that we don't have sank, uh, really high school wrestling at the sanctioned level is uh, Mississippi, maybe, you know? So, you know, Mississippi, until they become, and get, start wrestling, I don't even know they're in the union, you know, I don't even know they're in the country, okay? So, they gotta wait, I don't know, when, when 49 states has wrestling and only one doesn't, there's something wrong with them. So, anyway, so I looked at this Harvard thing, and I started reading this a couple years ago. I'm about done, Cap. My wife's always waiting for me. That's what I like about her. She's always waiting for me. She's still there, believe it or not. So, so I look at this Harvard Business Review and I start reading it. Well, this is about three years ago, two years ago. And I'm reading and I said, whoa, whoa, wow, wow. And these articles. You know, Harvard's a pretty good school. And I said, you know what? I wrote this magazine. Everything was in there. There's about leadership and about all these different ways of being successful. And I said, wow, they stole all this stuff from me. It didn't start, to be honest with you, and I find that out. But I think they're, this is, you know, newer than me. So they probably took it from me. But then I'm reading a little bit more, and it says something. Oh, so I read 20 things that I, I love, because I agreed totally with it. There was one I didn't like about it. I close it up. Ah, this is not my book. <laughs> not my book. I mean, that's just the way it is. It's the way I am. And that's why sometimes these guys get mad at me and they don't like to listen to me. Because sometimes I'm, I'm talking too much about something that maybe they, I don't know what I'm talking about or maybe I do. But anyway, uh, I, I won't get any more into it, but there's unbelievable. I'm not going to suggest that you get it because right now you're you better get a little more educated. And then, uh, it's one of these things. But I'll tell you, I, I, I spoke with Harvard too when I was out there. I had the Harvard wrestling team come over because at the last moment, I, I wanted to tell them how important they were to that area for the sport of wrestling and for the whole disciplines of the world. And those kids sat there and listened. And I don't know if they took it on or not, but as far as being not only good and maybe put out some good wrestlers, but just how they can affect those other seven colleges right there. I mean, what a, what could you have a better rivalry? And they do have a rivalry because some of the same sports are, are in this, on this college campus, on this college campus, on this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. And, you know, you should be able to walk right off one, your college campus and somebody's going to start throwing something at you because you're a good wrestler, because there's a rivalry. Jab, whatever, that type of stuff. Just fun, good stuff. But anyway, so we got a long ways to go, but yet we're first in the world in wrestling right now, which, you know what? <laughs> and we're first in the world at the junior level and the senior level. We were close at the cadet level. And 25 years ago, I think we were saying we were first. But we certainly don't want to wait another 25 years. Because that might not be in your lifetime. Or my, I should say my lifetime. But you know how old I am, 29. So, so anyway, um, anybody have anything you want to say to me? Because otherwise, uh, I've been
been married 43 years. I want to push 44 here pretty soon. <laughs> so anybody have anything? Any uh, it's good. There, here's one. What's your uh, best advice for winning? Just the mindset. You know what I mean? Best like, advice for winning yeah, the just mindset? Best advice. It don't take just this clinic. It doesn't take just this clinic. It's going to take another hundred of these clinics. And that doesn't mean you can't be, you know, somebody else too besides a wrestler. It just so happens that's just happened to be me. But, but you know what? I was also a coach. And so be, I learned my profession in wrestling as an athlete. So I had a profession in my life as a coach. Not too many can go from athlete, athlete, to all the way through coaching. It was a lifetime for me. It's a lifetime for me. So then my coaching's over, and what do I do? I'm speaking, I'm writing books, um, and I'm writing books on the mentality of sometimes wrestlers too, of short stories. Not, too, not Harvard type. Easier to understand. But you know, these are pretty easy too once you get educated a little bit. And I'm not taking away from any education as, as aspect at all. My best advice is to mentor up with good people and learn how to compete in life. And the best way to do it is right here in the wrestling room. Because there's no other sport that is this competitive one-on-one -on -one the whole time. So you learn how to compete in wrestling. And you may not win every time, but your chances of winning are much greater much greater because by that I mean if you're ever in a match where you're starting to get a little tired but you shouldn't even know it if you're competing you won't know it till after your match you won't know it then it won't affect your match so that's that's where you got to be okay but any other questions right here how do you prepare for matches how to prepare for matches uh, practices the day before, the day before, the day before. The only thing I do before a match, it's up to the individual how he wants to, but, the, but I go by science, warm up good, execute holds right before my match, pretty much maybe up until about the match before, then I still stay warm. But uh, you know, it, all my preparation for matches is all the time before. It's zero hour. Five, four, three, two, one, zero hour. My time to compete. My time to coach my athletes to compete. Zero hour. So if you look at it like that, you won't get caught with uh, not being ready to go. Whether it's a tournament or whatever else. Countdown between one match and the next. But uh, again, you know, to each their own. And it doesn't have to be that crazy. Just part of that craziness. And if, You've got to be a little goofy anyway to be out for the sport. So, <laughs> because I mean, because otherwise, you know, you you like to throw somebody down. Yeah. All right, my well, man. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. I just want to say, um, you talk about mentoring, and you're talking about you're here to be great. I have a mentor that I follow, and one of the things he says is, you don't come here to be good. And you don't come here to be great, but you come here to dominate. And it comes in the sport and in life. And I just wanted to say that it totally resonated with me. Well, thank you. <laughs> One thing I've done in my life is dominate. But I got flaws. And you got to learn how to work through them. Absolutely. Yeah. And my son is still a wrestler who wrestles in Iowa for Coach Duro right now. Well, you better pray for Coach Duro right now. I am every day. Yeah. Well, he's been diagnosed for uh, with cancer pretty bad so but he's a guy that's put his life on the in the sport as well anything, anything else otherwise yeah um, did you foresee your career as a coach when you were an athlete did you know you're gonna be a coach right afterward oh I never looked that far ahead yeah I mean the day I won the Olympics the next day when I, or, or so, I flew back. That's when I started that profession. I really uh, was preparing to be a coach all my life. And because of my, the way the mentorship happened at the YMCA, at home, my high school coach, my college coach, 
I didn't have to know what I was doing. I was prepared for coaching. All the teams that I was on through high school and college and even the Olympic teams, I helped affect a lot of the outcome along with the great guys on that team. But it was like, I was always the example and it's hard to believe that you didn't have to prepare for your profession as you're growing up, but I really was my whole life. <coughs> I have some of your quotes around the room on the wall and stuff like that. You know, one of them is your, your gold medal quote. And maybe hoping you could share that with us about how gold medals are really made. And then where, where, when did that actually originate? When did you actually come up with that? Well, actually, if you want to go to an Iowa wrestling meet, that's how I'm going to introduce... Uh, there's a big screen nowadays. You know, make a show out of wrestling. You know, you gotta, you gotta entertain. It's not, you can't just, it's not enough just to go out and put on the show on the map, which that's the main one. But it's, you gotta keep up. And so Iowa right now, I just cut a, a, not a commercial, I just cut a tape yesterday that says about first period's won by this, second period's won by that, and third period's won by mine, the, the most heart, best conditioning, most heart, best moves, stuff like that. But gold medals. It's not about the gold medals, but it's sure fun to get them put around. And if you look down and you look at the colors, it's sure fun to see the, the gold one as compared to some of the other ones. It's just that much more fun. The Penn State's operating right now. They're the, they're the team in college wrestling. And they are operating on the word fun. And you know what their fun is? They're women. They're women. And uh, if they're doing anything less in, in, in training, from a, then they're not going to win. So they're they're training hard. You know, don't think they're just playing dodgeball on practice. That's what they say they're doing a lot. They're still not going to win with, by just knowing dodgeball. But anyway, I got a lot of sayings, but it's just more important your actions than those words. All right. I'm pretty much done. My wife just said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, jerk in her neck. Because I tied up with her too many times. <laughs> good front tie. I like that. Get that elbow in. Don't get it out. Just keep it in. So anyway, thanks a lot. Thank wrestle people over there. Say hi, everybody. Okay, what else do we got? Here's our board. This is what we read here at Deerfield Wrestling, guys. There's the boys wrestling. We've got chip places. Um, we also have, let's see, that's our little, our locker room. These are all the people on here that have, like, multiple things. Multiple things. I have my son. Both of my boys are up here. Let's see. I can find them. I don't know where they are, but they're somewhere up there. 
They're up there. This is Deerfield wrestling, guys. He's really well. They're about to get started. They're about to drill. Here's your 40 win uh, board. Senior awards. And the last thing I'm going to show you. There's the boys all drilling. There's Johnny and Matt. There's Johnny. And, and Johnny's mad at me. Okay. But the only thing I want to show you is our trophy. Okay. Aaron, say hi. Hey, who is it? It's Facebook Live. It's oh, the trophy. There's voice right here. And this is our trophy from last year. We got some stuff here. Lots of people here. This is. This is Deerfield. This is what we do. And it's awesome to be part of an amazing, amazing community. Deerfield Wrestling Rules. Thank you for that amazing, amazing uh, speech. You guys should watch it. Have a great day.